Uh, so at this point, I'll invite Nicholas for a few minutes to deal with the mentee. In the meantime, uh, the presenters, please get ready for the panel discussion. Uh, it's going to be exciting. So you will get pinned on the screen. But before that, Nicholas, you're welcome for the uh, mentee so that we prepare for the panel discussion. So over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Wellington, for running the session and also for our speakers for today's session. So many surprises, especially for non-scientists, you'd say. Great. Now we are going to hear from you and how your thoughts are evolving based on attending this conference. And we'd love to know your thoughts, especially on how, based on what has been shared today, how can we bring down the silos? Because this is normally what normally comes up when discussing One Health. How can we bring down the silos, cooperate more, collaborate more? So, and the menti code remains the same. Let's hear. Yep, so people are saying we engage more, we change the mindset. And we communicate better, joint activities, teamwork. We deliberately engage, yeah. We reduce conflicts among the among the disciplines. We collaborate more. So let's see how far we are doing. We're having 20. 20 responses, yeah. But the message across Wellington is that people are asking for more collaboration, more engagement among the various disciplines. So I think the message is coming across. So maybe from there, I'll hand it over to you for panel discussion, and then we can hear more questions. Thank you. Thanks very much. So let me welcome our presenters uh, for this afternoon for a panel discussion. And from the program, as you can see, we want to dive deep into strategies for developing, implementing, and sustaining One Health education in our higher learning institutions. Uh, I don't know whether we're able to see our panelists. Uh, you are uh, five, I think. Yes. So let me welcome you on board. Uh, and let me thank you for the exciting and thought provoking presentations that you have just made. This is highly appreciated on behalf of all participants. So we now have an opportunity to engage you or for you to explain further and dive deeper into the discussions engage uh, through this panel discussion. Let me just quickly explain how it's structured so that I don't get you by surprise. So we'll start off by setting the scene by a bit of uh, what I call cross-fertilization of ideas and uh, perspectives, and just giving you an opportunity to give a comment or add a point to someone else's presentation for clarity, and that should take a very short time. Uh, and then uh, we will go to specific questions uh, I have some specific questions which I'll be asking you to comment on or to give some perspectives on. And then, of course, we'll go to a wrap up. And in the wrap up, I will be asking you to give us your take home message. What is your take home message and who should be listening to that message? So I think that gives you a bit of um, what uh, to expect. So let's start it off. Let's cross fertilize our ideas. I want to invite. Uh, any of you in any order uh, to take uh, half a minute just to comment or give an additional perspective uh, to any of the presentations that your colleagues uh, your colleagues gave. Uh, I don't know whether you'd like me to mention names, but if you are ready, just unmute and uh, and go ahead. Um, my name is Mabel. I, I just wanted to add to the presentations that have been made that uh, one 
one thing for us to really sustain uh, collaborations around One Health, we have to take on board the fact that it's not a short term uh, or a bullet uh, magic that we, we are aiming for. To build uh, trust and uh, uh, across the partners or amongst partners, across various sectors, and to meaningfully engage takes time. So my point is that it is, uh, we are in it for the long haul and we should expect that uh, this will be also an expensive undertaking, that it's not cheap to, to find uh, uh, opportunities to break these silos and uh, persistence uh, will also help um, uh, at least nurture that, that team spirit uh, to break down the silos that uh, we tend to experience over time. Uh, okay. The un undoing is that uh, at times we give it a try and then we say it's not working. We are too quick to, to give up. So that's my perspective. Thank you. Yeah, so it doesn't come easy, it takes time, it needs patience and persistence. And, and sometimes uh, you have to put in a lot of your personal energy and a lot of focus. Uh, so it's not that easy. Cool. Uh, anyone yeah. else? I yes, can please. go next thing. Half Thank a minute. You. Half a minute. Yes, yes. Very quickly. Thank you. So um, cats are notoriously independent animals. But somebody once said, if you want to herd cats, you have to move the food. And I think the collaboration that we seek requires that we reward collaborations in, instead of independent performance. This has to change in academic departments and schools where veterinary medicine and human medicine and environmental science and the social sciences are rewarded for performing within their disciplines. And it's very difficult to judge collaboration across disciplines, but we have to recognize that as a one health imperative uh, mm -hmm. and do it not just for faculty, but in service professionals and, our, and not sure that in our students. Thank you. Okay, so some new homework, new ways of doing things, new ways of looking at uh, systems and new ways of looking at uh, performance and all that within our institutions. All right, good. Yeah, I um, want to come in. Yes, Margaret. Yeah, thank you. Just a very quick one to add on that, um, you know, uh, the, the, the longest journey starts with a step and the step that uh, we have to start making is uh, in our institutions, because this is where we have the young people, we have very large uh, groups of students and we can change culture and practice when they are coming into the university. So if we can have, we can purpose to have a day where the disciplines, you know, the, the health sciences meet up with the agricultural scientists. The agricultural scientists meet up with the School of Journalism because we have seen that even within the universities, we have talent in who can help us in communication, but we never meet. So if we can purpose to do that so that two or three disciplines get a day where they meet up and thrash out some of the issues, especially in One Health. I think that that will make a big difference. And within the four or five years when uh, these, these uh, students are in the universities and beyond, then they'll have started bonding together. And then they go out now to various institutions, then they already have that culture. They already have that collaborative spirit. Thank you. Yeah, it's very true. And I remember in one of the workshops uh, we had some time back uh, with students and uh, scientists and lecturers, the students actually were asking uh, in this conference or in this workshop, how come we don't have people from discipline X and faculty this and that, and yet you are telling us we are supposed to, you know, to act in this way. So it's a challenge. We talk about these things, but then we have to reflect back and see exactly how we do it, where we start, and where we have to end. Okay, very well put. So moving on, uh, let's move on to the individual uh, questions. Uh, so yesterday, uh, I think one of the issues that came up, uh, somebody said that uh, they took a course in designing interdisciplinary research. And they think that that was more useful or more helpful in thinking about one health than our second course that was actually about One Health, all right? 
So I wonder, Prof Nangami, what would be your, your gut feeling about this? How would you respond to this? What do you think about this? That actually taking a course in designing interdisciplinary research, somebody say that they found that more useful than an individual course uh, about One Health. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, I, I although I didn't attend yesterday's, but uh, I can uh, appropriately respond to this question. Um, it's true when you think of One Health, uh, it is an approach. It's not a discipline. So at times we tend to put a lot of emphasis on uh, designing separate courses that, uh, uh, and even at university we are challenged whether this has enough theory need to stand alone as a, as a course. So to me, that question uh, directs our attention to always think that one, remember that one health is an approach and this approach can best demonst be demonstrated through the practice. Uh, and part of the practice in academia is the research uh, that we are trying to, to at least grow as a, an area so that we you know, nurture the other aspects or principles of uh, yeah, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, the interconnectedness uh, that we, we desire to see. So yes, it is true, but uh, learning the approach alone without the theoretical background can also create another gap in terms of comprehension and application of the knowledge. So I would say that going forward, we need to balance, uh, depending on your background, we need to balance the two. So if you are from a social background and you've not engaged in any of the science fields, there's a strong recommendation that you need the theoretical foundations in some of those areas, not the technical aspects, but just that for understanding to be able to meaningfully uh, apply, but also mm -hmm. if you are you are well versed in uh, in some of the areas, uh, depending on your earlier degree, then that uh, application through research uh, is uh, worth it in terms of uh, then focusing on another theoretical course that would bring you the foundations of either microbiology or whatever it is that may be necessary. Thank you. Uh, thanks. <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, Professor Oladele, I think you presented a very comprehensive approach, highlighting some of the things you are doing within your program. Uh, I wonder, putting all that into perspective, what would be your response to this or your comment uh, on that particular observation by the participant yesterday? Uh, half a minute, please. Thank you. Um, I think when we speak about uh, an approach that needs to be demonstrated. Um, the importance of One Health is to prepare us uh, effectively, and we can't wait till an emergency situation happens for people to figure out how to communicate, for example, or how to uh, talk to um, uh, surveillance teams in animal sector or human sector or environmental sector. So it is an approach, but it still needs that competency to be acquired and uh, verified and uh, delivered on demand. And that's why the education is so important in addition to the technical skills, of course. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, moving on, let me turn to Dr. Abum, right? what we have been listening to and all these good perspectives and uh, successes, lessons learned, uh, what we are doing, what we are planning. One would ask, uh, is One Health marketable? Is One Health marketable? Uh, and how can we foresight its value and embed findings in the curricula? At the last part? Uh, so is One Health marketable? Yes. That is the first bit of it. And how can we foresight its value mm -hmm. and embed the findings in curricula? So <clears throat> thank you very much for that. I'd like to say One Health is uh, marketable. If you look at uh, the various areas in One Health that uh, need to be, need to be, to be tackled, then we'd see that it's a very wide concept. Mm -hmm. And uh, from the different uh, 
engagements we've had with stakeholders, including needs assessment, we find that uh, many people really want to undertake this program. And I think that was part of the justification for development of the curriculum in infectious disease and global health. So the market survey shows that there are multiple people who want to undertake the course and they're from multiple disciplines. And it is for that reason why when we are developing uh, the curriculum, which, uh, we, which we spoke about earlier in the presentations uh, by Professor Mabel and I, you find that it's a curriculum that's open to all professions so that we can have the multidisciplinary groups of people trained in uh, One Health uh, principles. And uh, we can also have an opportunity to develop workforce that are ready to respond to One Health challenges. If the second question is about uh, foresight in its value, I think it's important that we look at it in terms of, um, as I said again, workforce. How much workforce do you require to respond to these uh, emerging threats, uh, not just infectious disease, but also climate change and uh, several other factors. So it is a discipline that uh, definitely needs to be enhanced. But then we also need to be careful not to have uh, a program that creates uh, generalists, if I can use that term, or one that can uh, create uh, opportunity for quacks to join uh, certain professions. But it's something that uh, when we engage with the regulatory authorities, then we're able to curtail that and prevent that from occurring. So that's mm -hmm. what I'd say. Thank you. All right. So, so I think in your answer, you mentioned uh, a number of things, uh, which to me give me a bit of thin lines between a number of perspectives or a number of issues, uh, regulatory authorities and, uh, you know, generalists and that kind of thing. So it makes me wonder, so how, how is this structured? How is the One Health you know, training structured, what is it targeting or who is it targeting and how do you define marketability? Just wondering in my, how do you define that? Okay, that's and a, any of the panelists can also jump in just yeah. for sake of clarity, yes. Yeah, that's an interesting question because I'm not an expert in marketing. So I'd like to add uh, throw marketability to the rest of my panelists. But as you're saying, okay. uh, the value of having the regulatory bodies on board whenever you're developing any curricula is that it enables it to be to have uh, a robust control mechanism for the students who are actually undertaking the course and it also helps to improve marketability because they know for instance uh, i think we're having a situation currently between uh, the tsc and the graduate teachers mm -hmm. so the tsc i assume is a regulatory authority and we have the graduate teachers and they're having these issues when it comes to promotions. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you have regulatory authorities on board during the curriculum development process, you find that whoever is um, graduating from the course, uh, for instance, if he's registered by the veterinary board, by the medical and dentist practitioners uh, board, they are already, it's a degree program that is acceptable to them. So when this person graduates, he has opportunities for career development within his profession, mm -hmm. and that definitely enhances the marketability. And for us, we look at it in terms of workforce that is available to respond. Because if you have workforce who are available, but they're not marketable in their profession, very few, few people would want to join that actual course. So it's a win-win for us. Thank you. So marketability, I'll throw it to mm -hmm. the rest of the panelists. Okay, I'm sure the one or two panelists are thinking about that. But in the meantime, uh, uh, Caroline, given the path you have walked, do you have do you have a comment that is itching in that perspective that you would like to contribute at this moment? Less than a minute. Um, thank you. Um, I think in my case, I would I would just put forward or recommend. Uh, engagement of alumni from the One Health uh, workforce trainings, pre-workforce mm -hmm. trainings, 
and uh, I think there's a wealth of uh, of potential you can tap into using them as One Health ambassadors and also to mainstream One Health, which will, will benefit very many sectors at mm -hmm. uh, at all levels. Yes, okay. thank you. And also motivate uh, the environment uh, professions more into One Health. Thank you. Okay. So over to the other panelists, uh, the issue of uh, marketability. Anybody with a, uh, would like to give uh, yeah, I, some I intervention? Yeah, I can jump in quickly. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So uh, I did put a link to the chat uh, for a stakeholder survey for the One Health Workforce Academy that we are conducting. We've had hundreds of responses so far, but everybody is welcome to share their point. And we have questions about this um, marketability. Uh, One Health has to add value to employers. Uh, the question is, why would I, as a you know, Minister of Health or nonprofit organization, charged with protecting uh, public health and global health security, why would I want somebody who's trained in One Health than simply hiring a public health, a masters in public health or a physician or vet uh, or, or social scientist. I think, you know, the employers have to show uh, us, the trainers, that uh, they need people who are ready to hit the ground running uh, without additional training when um, we have spillover events. And it's not easy to do that in a single discipline. So having the experience of working together, learning the skills of collaboration and partnerships and communication and the kind of transdisciplinary surveillance research uh, is not something, as I previously mentioned, that you learn very quickly at the time of crisis. So I think that when we have a lot of trained One Health graduates in employment and the employers reward them uh, and put them in positions of authority and decision-making, then we would have succeeded in demonstrating the marketability of One Health. Our survey results so far show that employers want this kind of training, but they are not yet sure how to reward those who are trained beyond those who are uh, mm -hmm. independent, you know, it's more independently uh, trained uh, in single disciplines. So we need to match the training with the reward system uh, at the employment sector. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Fair Knife. Quite complex, and it's good you shared the link with some of the studies that you have conducted and the findings that you have so far. That will be useful to, to our participants. Now, turning over to, to Margaret, uh, and this is something you have been talking about for a while. Now, looking at One Health and what we are discussing uh, since yesterday, one would ask or one would wonder, how easy is it for institutional structures, frameworks, and policies to embrace these nice requirements for One Health education and, and, and practice? How, e how practical, how easy is it? What is your experience in this? Thank you. I would say that uh, it is not that easy because uh, we have this very strong, strongly held beliefs and mindsets. Everybody is sticking to their own territory. And so anytime you try to encroach, you know, people feel like you are encroaching into somebody else's uh, territory. And so uh, one of the things that uh, we also need to really equip uh, those who are getting into implementation of One Health is on is soft skills, you know, soft skills of negotiating, conflict management, just managing expectations. Because uh, once you get into the system and you challenge the status quo, then uh, people all of a sudden become very hostile to you. So I would say we really need those soft skills so that you can be able to manage some of these uh, conflicts that are going to happen when you get to talk to a policymaker in health and why he should allocate a uh, budget, not just to the human health uh, component, but also to share that budget with somebody from the environmental field, because then it means you are reaching or you're arriving at one goal of ensuring one health. 
All right. Uh, what about um, Dr. Rabuom? You talked about your program uh, and the nice work that you are doing, all these uh, good proposals. How easy was it or difficult was it to deal with the policy side of things, different faculties and the people in their institutional policies? How easy was, was it or how difficult was it and what did you do? Oh, thank you very much. Um, this is uh, something we did in conjunction. I can see Professor Nangami uh, on the other side. But as you're saying, it wasn't easy trying to work with uh, the many professions who are involved in uh, One Health. And um, first of all, there were issues of uh, funding and we were lucky to get uh, support from a partner who was able to, to fund the whole exercise. We also got uh, expertise from our, our partner universities. Most of them are from the US and uh, this definitely helped to, to ease in the burden of developing the program. Um, we also had to look at uh, our institutions because as we keep saying, we all have uh, our mindsets and uh, trying to change uh, certain, uh, I don't know what term to use, certain uh, entrenched uh, principles, uh, trying to, to tell, for instance, uh, someone who's been working in microbiology for many years or public health, that is soon going to, to get uh, graduates from, uh, from journalism, for instance, uh, it's not easy. So trying to change that mindset was definitely a challenge, but we are lucky that uh, through several uh, workshops and engagements we had with faculty as well as with various partners were able to to convince them that uh, this is the way to go the world is changing uh, the term health professional is a term that is quite fluid and we need to accept that for instance someone who is a specialist in health economics is also a health professional so we really need to change our mindsets change the way we think uh, some of, someone had asked a question whereby he had mentioned that are we breaking silos or uh, building bridges? We need to actually find ways of uh, linking the silos or breaking them, as we always say, because it is these silos that lead to uh, these uh, emergence of these One Health challenges, because we can no longer rely on one profession to protect the whole world from challenge X or challenge Y. We need uh, to adopt these multidisciplinary approaches and therefore we need to have multidisciplinary uh, one health specialists out there who are ready to work together and manage these complex uh, challenges that we have out there. Uh, probably I'd ask uh, Professor Nangami to add a few more comments on this because we're working on this together with her. Yeah, in one minute. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Abom. Yes, um, getting into the policy space is, is a very tricky issue. It touches matters of uh, governance and uh, effective leadership to be able to navigate this change that we are seeking within institutions, but also beyond that, the, the policy network uh, within the, the at government level. So yes, it's true that within more university, for example, any other university, one thing that we don't have is uh, adequate policies to address some of these needs that we are more, uh, discussing. And I would give an example. For example, when you hire a lecturer in a university, uh, you are expected to demonstrate your own professional competences. If you are a medical doctor, they expect that you'll be working in a clinic as well as teaching the students. If you are a sociologist, you do expect to be publishing in a journal of sociology and not all this cross-cutting, cross -cutting, multidisciplinary and so on. If you rise the career ladder to be a professor, you are expected again to profess in your own discipline. So until we have policies that properly recognize that multidisciplinary approach, give it its importance and place within universities, it will still continue to, to challenge us. Um, the other aspect about uh, university policies or institutional policies is the admission aspect. We struggled with this but luckily in Kenya, we have the Kenya University Placement Board. So once you specify the minimum requirements uh, within a curriculum, that is feasible. But again, it speaks to how can you have an 
somebody with an arts background going to do a science-based program and so on. So it's the issue of both mindset at individual level, but also the policy support, the governance that will then lead to allocation of adequate resources to be able to effectively address this. We need to okay. probably lobby. Uh, lobbying is one thing that we need to, and you can't lobby empty handed. We need evidence where we have proven that One Health works to market to our policymakers, decision makers, to be able to effect this change. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, quite some homework uh, uh, to accomplish uh, before we can make uh, great leaps in terms of process. So moving away from that, and uh, not to ambush the director of uh, vet services in Narok, uh, who is my friend, I talked to him yesterday. I would like to request you, li listening to all this uh, as, um, as a government official, somebody who receives uh, these graduates and uh, somebody who manages uh, lots of structures and policies downstream. Uh, what is your comment? What is your gut feeling about uh, this discussion about you know One Health Education uh, and how to get those competent graduates uh, coming on your side and how do they fit in? Uh, is there, do you have a comment on this or some advice? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I feel, I personally feel that this is a very, very critical uh, aspect and approach to health uh, delivery. That's why I am really here for all the three days. So I can listen in and get the most that I can from the presenters and all the uh, members present. So um, it, is, it is actually very critical that we have uh, our trainees and graduates uh, getting this One Health uh, approach in their, in their learning and even uh, to have some aspect of uh, actual implementation. So I think it is very important that we bring, in the end, we have to bring everybody to the same understanding in all the disciplines that are concerned so that we can begin uh, the journey together. And uh, we actually on the ground feel that there's some, there's some resistance from uh, certain aspects. And this is just about attitudes. Mm -hmm. So we would in the end have to change these attitudes beginning from our trainees. And, uh, and although we say that it's not easy to teach an old dog new tricks, but we may try and, uh, and see how far we can go. It, mm -hmm. is, it is very, very uh, critical. We have these experiences in various uh, aspects, obviously very easily in the area of zoonotic uh, diseases, mm -hmm. but we have the same experiences in food uh, safety. So we have this um, uh, feeling that there are some gaps that can only be filled if we are working together and working together. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. But uh, just a quick uh, follow up from your side of the story or from your side of the experience, uh, looking at uh, institutional aspects, structures and policies, how is it, how easy is it to absorb this, uh, the, the, the people we train, you know, when they come as uh, people who are uh, in One Health in one minute? Uh, definitely, uh, in the government system, once you have uh, approved uh, trainings, they are equally developed uh, schemes of, of, of service mm -hmm. for, for such uh, trainees. So uh, definitely, as, as curricula develop, there must be a sensitization in government that there's these, these people that have this shared knowledge and we need to develop uh, new schemes because it is these schemes that separate the various uh, careers in government. And they're the ones that build the, uh, the walls in service uh, delivery or in working together to deliver uh, services. So if, if we work together right from development of curricula to development of schemes, then it will be seamless when sending these people to, to, to the public service. Okay, thanks very much for uh, coming in uh, very quickly to give those perspectives. Uh, almost the last question as we draw towards uh, your wrap up uh, panelists. 
so very quickly, I would like uh, each one of you to just to highlight two key skills you think uh, are very uh, necessary for us to grow in our next generation, one health workforce. What are those two key skills that you feel are really critical? Let's start with uh, uh, Professor Oladele. What are those two key Thank skills you. you think they are very critical? Yeah. Thank you. I put in the chat uh, one of the outcomes of our international uh, Delphi panel on uh, One Health competencies. One mm -hmm. that came out um, uh, strongly is implementation science. And the second is translational science. These are uh, terms that are used uh, primarily in the health sciences to show that scientific knowledge that's published in the journals uh, are not the end of the story. We need to make them into solutions that are sustainable. Mm -hmm. So implementation science uh, really affects how we, trans how we make knowledge relevant to local situations. Uh, something that okay. works in the United States may not work uh, in Nairobi, mm -hmm. Kenya. And we need to be able to recognize uh, the social uh, aspects of One Health and its role in implementation. All of the uh, topics on gender context and cultural context uh, okay relationships between um, humans and animals and the environment are very local. And so that has to be okay. part of the One Health uh, implementation science. And the translation okay. uh, about, for example, antimicrobial resistance, uh, knowing that they exist is not the same as preventing uh, the transmission of resistant infections. We need mm -hmm. to be able to do that uh, at the population level. So those I, I think are key uh, that have not really been a part of the discussion on uh, competencies, but they're critical. Thank you. Great, uh, Margaret. Sorry, my network. Yeah, so from where I stand, I, I see we need a very strong science communication skills because they help us really engage and reach to the hearts and minds of the, the different actors, the policymakers, the people at the bottom, the people at the top. Uh, and, and so if you are able to do that, science communication is one of the soft skills that we must build along the way. The second, of course, is um, that of partnership building. I think if you're able to accommodate, be more accommodative by just learning how best human relationships work, then it will be so much easier for us to get these disciplines working together and the same case with the people working together. Because at the end of it, it's the people, it's the people skills that will really build this One Health culture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Abuom. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I think I'd like to agree with Margaret that uh, communication skills are key to the development of uh, One Health, as well as uh, how we develop partnerships. And I also like to think we need to find ways of how to influence policy, how to take that research from uh, the publication to implementation at the level of uh, the Mamamboga. So how do we do that? How do we influence policy? So it's something that I think is very key. And we need to find ways of uh, enhancing this competency amongst uh, the different players in One Health. Thank you very much. Good. Caroline, you are in a unique position, forward looking. What do you have to say? I, I also agree that science communication is a key competency and also collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Uh, last but not least, uh, Mabel, in half a minute, what are your two key picks? Uh, digital uh, data analytics as a skill, because without evidence, will not advance too far. Second is skills around the area of uh, knowledge management. In one health, if it's multidisciplinary, 
uh, multi-sectorial, we are communicating to diverse audience. So we must mm -hmm. learn how to configure messages for the different audience, right from the community local to the policy makers. So that's a skill that we'll need to be able to break down those uh, silos. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for, uh, for those uh, insights. Uh, the last question, uh, as we draw to a close and I'd hit into this. So putting everything in perspective, the discussions we have had uh, from where you stand, from what you have heard, the other panelists, and even the discussions yesterday, uh, what would be your key take home message? Very brief and sharp, what would be your key take home message and who should be listening to that message in particular? So uh, again, I have a prize, everybody half a minute. So let's start with Margaret. Yeah, my typical message is that um, One Health is the way to go. It's an approach that is going to help us resolve many of the uh, human, animal, agriculture, environmental challenges that, are, that our continent is facing today, in fact, our global community. And who should be listening to that? Policymakers, so that they can allocate okay. money and resources. Cool. Uh, Prof. Oladele. Thank you. We need to make sure that One Health Education is high quality, consistent, and reproducible across institutions. And that requires a board that is respected and their guidance of the competencies in my view. Professor Nangami is one of them. We have many at this conference. Uh, that quality control will ensure marketability, accreditation, and uh, support from all the professionals that contribute to One Health as an approach. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now that you mentioned Professor Nangami, uh, take your one minute or less to give us your key message and who should be listening to it? Evidence, evidence, evidence. Let the evidence speak for us. We cannot mm -hmm. preach without something in the hand. Uh, who should be listening to us? Uh, all those who are aligned in the education sector, including the researchers, as well as the implementers and the policy makers across all the disciplines, transdisciplinary and sectors. Thank you. Okay, cool. Caroline, as usual, we are in a unique position. You are next generation workforce. So what is your take home message to, to, to us? Let me put it that way. Um, my, my key message is that the principles of One Health uh, would really benefit not just the health sector, mm -hmm. but solve uh, several global issues, including climate change, biodiversity loss. And so I, I feel that One Health, and I know that One Health is, some, is, uh, is an approach that would benefit several uh, professions out mm -hmm. there in order to solve and even to achieve the SDGs. So um, yes, we should continually uh, not shy away from inviting various professions. Yes, mm -hmm. and they, they will definitely benefit from the One Health Principles. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you have any particular stakeholder who should be listening to that? Um, well, uh, I believe this is important for all actors, policymakers, okay. government, civil society. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Last but not least, Abuom. What are we taking home from you? Okay, thank you very much uh, once again. I think uh, I'd like to say work of, workforce development, One Health workforce development is uh, key. Uh, I, don't, I think uh, lessons from COVID show us that uh, we are definitely not there as a, as a whole world. We need to enhance the development of uh, professionals who can work at uh, as multidisciplinary teams and at different levels, and also be able to influence uh, the different stakeholders, including government, uh, education, uh, professionals, 
uh, economists, the religious bodies, everyone. So we need to really widen the scope and uh, be able to influence all these different uh, professions mm -hmm. and different cadres from the Mamamboga to the president. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. So from what you are saying, there is uh, lots of opportunity, uh, lots of work to do, uh, great space. Uh, lessons have been learned. Uh, we are beginning to see success. There is a lot of engagement, uh, but we definitely have some homework to do uh, jointly, uh, even if it's creating coherence or uh, uh, creating boundaries or breaking down silos. Uh, it's quite some work to do in order to, to unleash the potential of One Health and what we can do with it. Uh, let me uh, stop here and thank all the presenters uh, for their contribution. Very nice presentations, very nice, very nice discussions. It has been a privilege to coordinate this. Uh, and I hope that the points that we have, we have gathered uh, will give us an agenda and inform the way forward as far as One Health uh, in Africa is concerned. So with those few remarks, let me hand over back to either Nick uh, or Leon to close us up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much to our panelists, um, both the panelists that we've just seen and all our presenters from today. Thank you so much to Dr. Wellington for that wonderful chairing and to Dr. Bernard Bett and um, Professor Salome Bukacci um, for their chairing of the session earlier today. So um, we are running over time. So thank you to all of you all online who have uh, lasted the course. And I'm just going to remind you that we reconvene tomorrow at 13.45, so 1.45 Nairobi time with our really great um, session on sort of, we've worked through the, the research, we've looked at the capacity gaps, we've looked about gender mainstreaming. Now we really get to how we are gonna put this into policy and implementation. And that's where we start again tomorrow. So we look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you very much. And we'll close there. Bye.